All right, and we should be good in there. There we go. Come on. There we go. All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Um, welcome back to another episode of the Camera Roll Chronicles. Um, we are trying something a little bit different today. We have a professional live streaming software and all that good stuff that I downloaded like an hour ago. So if this, uh, if we have any sort of issues or anything, uh, bear with me. Um, but today I am super, super excited. I'm here with Skystack. Um, Sky. Aside from being just a branding genius, um, Sky is a lifelong entrepreneur, branding expert, and marketing strategist. He owns Reserved Agency in uh, Boise, uh, Idaho. Did I say that right? Yes, sir. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> um, and a, uh, a branding and strategy agency for offer, uh, offer owners, coaches, consultants, and online experts. Um, after teaching himself Photoshop at the age of eight, which is insane to me because I own a content agency and I suck at Photoshop, um, this guy's made it an uh, obsession out of marrying branding and culture with business results. So without further ado, um, Sky, I'm going to let you take over a little bit and um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and then we'll get into uh, some questions. Yeah, what's up, Parker? Hey, dude, really good to be here. Total honor to be here. Um, so yeah, a little bit about myself. So uh, like I said, I started at a young age doing this stuff. I taught myself Photoshop when I was eight. I was winning websites at nine. When I was 12, I was working for the local skate shops, making sticker designs and figuring out how to create something from the screen and actually have it go out there in real life, right? Versus just like create pictures and things like that. Um, and so this has really been uh, what I've done my entire life. I don't know anything different. Um, and this obsession with, with brands, with fonts, with colors, with all of these things, um, have kind of carried me throughout my career. And so for a long time, I think we'll be talking about a little today, a little bit for local businesses, um, which is where I actually cut my teeth in a lot of the marketing, a lot of the branding that I do. Um, so I'm really excited that even though like more work these days, I'm working with the personal brands, working more with the you know, online experts and authors and speakers and things like that. Um, really excited today to bring back some of my roots, talk about some local marketing, talk about some local video marketing and branding for those kind of peeps and be able to rock out from there. Awesome, dude. So, um, first of all, you know, you and I understand obviously that, you know, building an audience and attracting the right people that you want is crucial to getting, um, especially inbound leads and stuff on social. Um, 100%. so first of all, I want to just talk about kind of some, some insights on like key indicators and key elements for creating a brand that attracts the audience that you're looking for. Um, and sort of what role does video marketing play into that, especially with yeah. like the clients that you've serviced? 100%, 100%. So whenever we talk about, whenever we talk about attracting people with brand, um, what I always like to think about is affinity. All right. So um, for example, my brand is, you can see it, it's very kind of dark and moody, right? If you've seen any of the materials that we put out, um, you know, they're, they have like tattoo artwork on the cover, right? Um, and that's because we're going after a very specific kind of an edgy person. So the people inside of your um, your audience, right? The, the best people that you want to work with you, um, they have certain stories about the world, right? They have certain ideas about how things should be. They have um, tastes, right? Either aesthetic tastes uh, or just, you know, general tastes. And, and I'll give like a pretty tangible example. So um, one, of the, one of the local businesses that we worked really, really well at as a niche was the med spa industry. And we crushed it with video and we crushed it with marketing for them by just focusing on one thing, which was how can we make this seem expensive? Even when we're running the cheapest Botox sale you've ever imagined, let's pretend like this isn't a sales event, but this is like a, a trip to Rome. And so for the entire, for the video, for the, um, the graphics, the promotions, for everything we did for this particular uh, bed spa, everything we did seemed like you were this woman walking through a Parisian love story, or, you know, you're traveling through Europe, and we had all the graphics, all of the brand, all the video, um, be telling the story that you are, uh, oh, man, did I just freeze here? Looks like my camera just froze. Um, oh, no. Oh, no. All right, let's try this again. Oh. Nope. All right, well, I'm going to keep talking here while I while I figure out what's going on here with the uh, the cameras and this, this funny that, of course, would be here with you, Parker. Uh, but what we're actually <laughs> able to what we're actually able to figure out is uh, we're actually able to figure out that if we um, if we 
brand things to be like the stories that people already have, then we can actually play into those stories and we can actually get a little bit of momentum piggybacking from the back of that. So from the fact that people have these stories, these different movies that painted European luxury and haute couture and Louis Vuitton, as something that was actually worthy for them and actually have something that was high end, we were able to borrow some of that brand. And so um, that's what, what I recommend people start out with is like, think about what kind of stories are there with your target customer that they are already believing in. They right. How can you actually be using being infusing into your creative, infusing into, you know, just your, your everyday promotions. I think as you're uh, as you're trying to fix the uh, the webcam, I think you're you're cutting out a bit. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, there. there we go. Yeah. All right, here. All right, can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Beautiful. All right, give me just one second here, Parker. You know how these things go sometimes. That I do. All right, let's give this one last shot. And while we're uh, we're taking this little technical difficulty break, um, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns about branding or anything else video marketing related, um, just drop them in the comments. I'll try to get to um, to some before we get out of here, but we do have a lot of really good stuff to talk about today. Um, also, we're gonna be kicking some teeth in about uh, about branding and breaking some beliefs today. So I hope you guys brought a neck. Let's see. All right. All right. Well, whilst we wait, um, let's see. So we've got a few people on here still. So talk to me, guys. What um, what do you guys have going on today? I know I've got a lot of meetings today. We're going to sign a couple of people on. That's always exciting. There we are. All right. Here we go. Here we go. All right. We're back. <laughs> Full. Full system reset. We just make sure we're right everything going on here. All right, we're back. All right, thanks for that. Awesome. Apologize for that, there, Parker. Appreciate you being patient. No worries. No worries. Um. So anyway, um, let's get back to what. So you started talking about um, like the the stories and things that Correct. um people kind of associate with um with your brand and things like that. So um, I think I think that's where you left off. So yeah, yes, let's let's just start there. Yeah, so let's go back there. So the customers that you wanna be working with, right? Because every business you have customers you wanna be working with and you have customers you don't wanna be working with. You know, um, even if you're just a local business, you're a bowling alley, you're, um, you know, you're a, a med spa, you're an esthetician, like you're gonna have these, these clients that you want more of and these clients that you want less of. And so what I'd like to start with is like, hey, who are our best clients? And what do they all have in common in terms of their taste, right? You know, are they all big fans of rom-coms? Are they all, um, you know, do they like um, Ron Burgundy? Do, do they have these certain cultural affinities that um, are all in common? And then how can we actually take that and then we can infuse that into the marketing, right? So uh, for example, for us, like when we, uh, when I used to be in the med spa industry with our agency, what I used to do is I used to uh, build these promotions where the promotions were like a, a trip through Europe, right? Um, we did this through video, we did this through email, we did this through um, through social, uh, all of that. And we built it as if it was this high-end trip to Europe because we saw that the customers that were spending the most inside of this particular business, uh, they were travel lovers, right? They were travel lovers, they were luxury lovers, and we wanted to give that infusion. So even if we were selling Botox for dirt cheap, we actually branded the thing like it was this, um, you know, this this walk down the the Couture uh, Avenue during uh, in Paris or uh, taking a, a trip to Rome or something like that. 
So we could actually bring in those stories and have people from um, from a level bring in the affinity because branding is a it's a it's a game of association. It's how many things do you already associate in the world, and how can we actually associate ourselves? We can marry us to the things that you already like or that the target customer already enjoys so that when you think of those things, when you think of us, they're connected. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I actually just recently learned about like the, the true definition of what branding is. Um, and I, you know, learned that through the, uh, the Hermoses talking about how, um, you know, brand is just associating something that you do know with something that you don't know, mm -hmm. you know, for example, like if you put Supreme on a $10 t-shirt, you just turn that into a $500 t-shirt for sure. Simply because that, that brand is associated with a lot of high value. So, um, that's, that's a lot of the stuff that we try and really hit on here is you, you not only need to be the part, but you need to look the part as well, 100%. you know, because you need, you need people to know, like, and trust you, especially if you're online. And the only way to do that is to look like someone who is no like, and trustworthy. hundred um, percent. So yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, so I hear you talk a lot about your presentation and, um, and I feel like that kind of leads off of what we were just talking about. Um, and you know, obviously like you and I both have a fairly decent setup as far as, um, like webcams and stuff are, um, for like podcasts and video calls and things like that. So what types of things have you seen with your clients, um, as far as making just those little adjustments and, and what types of, I guess, benefits have you seen off that? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I think the the biggest fear that people have when they create video marketing is, is it going to be any good? Just with any kind of marketing in general, but especially with video. You know, they're, they're concerned about the video quality. They're concerned about the audio quality. They're concerned about, does it look good? Does it look professional? And that kind of a thing. Um, and there is a there is a virtue to like just getting started with what you have now, right? Don't don't wait for the perfect uh, perfect camera. And, you know, we probably both know people who have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on cameras, but haven't ever pressed record or the person who they just, they, <laughs> the person who I think of is like the guy who just keeps buying guitars and has like 10 guitars in his house, but he like never plays them. And he's always looking yeah. for the next guitar, the next pedal. But the, the flip side of that is like, if you are hesitant to create content because you don't like how it looks, well, you can make a one-time investment in how it looks. You can build something, a studio backdrop or studio like yours one time, you can buy a camera one time, get a good microphone one time and be able to go from there. And so, so that to be said, um, what we see with clients is that when we actually start working with their setups and we always start first with the audio, by the way, um, as you know, there's an age old content marketing stat that says that people are two to three times more likely to rage quit your videos if they have bad audio quality versus bad video quality. So we start with audio quality first. Um, and once people can actually hear their own voice, like on a zoom call, they can hear their own voice on a podcast and it sounds really crystal clear and good. Um, it actually, it, it's almost like a self-esteem boost. It's really crazy to, to see because they can actually start to hear themselves and see themselves as if they were creating a podcast with Joe Rogan or a podcast with, you know, all these other people, cause they literally have the same mic that these guys are using. And so what we actually see is we see that the fear of creating content decreases because they actually like how it looks and they actually like how it sounds. And then you actually get like this self-reinforcing feedback loop where it's like, oh man, you know, this is actually starting to sound really good. Uh, this is starting to look really good. And then they um, are able to kind of step out of their shells and have a little more confidence. Like, hey, like maybe I am a thought leader. Like maybe I am the person who should be saying this. Maybe I am the person who, um, you know, I, I can be on camera and looking good and sounding good. And all of the years of preparation that took to get to this point uh, now allow me to have a platform I can go from here on. Yeah, dude, I never even thought of that. That's so that's a really interesting perspective. Um, you know, because we deal with a lot of people in this group right now that are just very afraid of putting themselves out there, you know, because they're they're afraid of what other people are going to think, you know, they don't like how their voice sounds on camera, they don't like how they sure. look, you know, and all those things. And that, you know, I I didn't even realize that that in and of itself, just making your, your quality look better can make you feel better. Yeah. So that's really, it's really cool. Um, so what types of things do you do, especially when you're working with these people that, you know, aren't like PR professionals that are trying to gain that confidence, but just don't like, 
you know, the, the sound of their own voice. They mm. don't like to watch themselves. You know, they, they're afraid of being embarrassed, you know, things like that. What's, what's usually the, the go-to response to that? Yeah, for sure. So the, the first thing that I push people to do before they like, um, before they necessarily create reels on their own, right. Or they kind of do some, some DIY, uh, long form, short form is I just have them do lives like this. You know, we, we had a moment where I had to rehook over my webcam one USB hub wasn't working. I had to find another, plug it back in right here on this call. And we couldn't stop. We still have another, you know, 40 minutes to go. So I have to figure out how to get back into pocket, how to get back present with you and have this conversation and go from there. And that's the beauty of live video is because the reason there's two reasons, really there's three reasons why people aren't confident on camera. Um, first reason being is that they don't actually like how they look on camera. They don't like their setup, right? Maybe even their wardrobe as well isn't quite like, you know, they're not wearing the things that they think that their future self should be wearing. So they don't want to get on camera. Right. Um, so that might be a thing, but, um, from there on, what it really comes down to is they don't actually know their message. So they don't actually know what it is that they're going to say. Um, and really the second thing is they actually have like, so they just haven't practiced it and going live is kind of the jumping into the deep end of it where there are, you can't go back. You can't, uh, say, uh, 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 uh later guys. Like, no, like you have to say something and figure it out. And with um, like the comments, like I see we have a comment coming in from Facebook here um, with comments kind of coming in that also like gives you the opportunity when someone can say, hey, like, can you repeat that again? Hey, I didn't quite get that. It actually allows you to think about and to verbalize what it is you're going to say. Um, and so that's the thing that people miss out the most on when they look to promote their like promote themselves on video is, you know, they want to hop on a podcast like this. They want to you know go on stage. They want to do YouTube. They want to do reels but they haven't actually gotten the practice of talking about you know, their expertise, the practice of talking about their business, the practice of talking about, you know, to their audience, what their audience wants to hear. And so just doing lives and focusing exclusively on lives until you're actually able to get to the point where you can hire someone like you, Parker, um, or hire, you know, a video editor or something like that, who can actually help you create the production um, is, is the number one thing I recommend for people because it just allows you to get started and allows you to actually do the most important part, which is to find your own voice and to figure out how to talk about what you do in a way that connects with the people you want to connect with. Dude, that's a really good point. And I feel like that could also be a really good alternative for the smaller business owners that, you know, they don't have the time, but they also don't quite have the capital to invest in, you know, let's say a team like ours to come out and do their video. You know, and I think that a, you know, the, the alternative option of being able to do live video, which I've actually been trying to do more of, um, cause I like, tell, I'll tell you a little secret. I suck at these. <laughs> um, and, and I, like, I used to be a whole lot worse. Um, you know, and I've always used our, you know, our team and our video editing capabilities and all that stuff as kind of a crutch to, yeah. to, you know, build some more confidence for myself. And it is very like freeing to just be able to talk about whatever you're talking about and, and know that later, you know, you can chop that up into reels or whatever, and it's not going to take a whole lot of time and you're consistently getting better while you're doing that. For I think sure. that's huge. For sure. Um, you know, and, and what would you say to, you know, a CEO that let's say just is, is watching this right now and they like, they don't have a whole lot to spend but they know they need to start somewhere. Where is the place that they need to start? Yeah, so to start with brand or to start with content or? You no, know, to start with like making their um, their overall like video presence look better. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, great question. So where I would start first is just start with audio quality first. All right, um, so for me, what I recommend to everyone, this is the Shure SM7B. You'll see it on Andrew Huberman's podcast. You'll see it on Joe Rogan's podcast. You'll see it pretty much everywhere. Um, I see you. It looks like you have the NV7, um, which is like a great alternative as well. Um, but starting with the audio quality first um, and just getting that dialed in. What's crazy is if especially if you're CEO and you're taking Zoom calls, so you have a remote team or you have clients that you service remote, uh, you will hear endless compliments when you hop on with uh, with someone and they'd be like, wow, dude, you sound great. You sound like you're in a movie. You sound like this. You sound like this, right? Um, and, and so that'll like kind of get like the ball rolling for you. And then when you actually do those lives, um, you'll be able to be delivering the most impactful thing to people, which is people want to hear really good audio quality, no matter what you have bad audio quality on a podcast, bad audio quality on a YouTube video, on a, a wiki video, an internal doc, like people don't want to listen to that. It will grate on their soul to continue to, to listen and continue to watch that video. So start there. 
Um, and then from there, there's lots of different options. Um, I'm a big fan of using mirrorless cameras uh, for webcams. So even though uh, the USB hubs sometimes will fail you, the actual cameras won't. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big Sony fanboy um, just because of the uh, the autofocus and the eye tracking that they have there. I know you're... I know Park is a Canon guy. I, I used to be a Canon guy many, many moons ago. And um, that to be said, um, just getting a, a, like a mirrorless camera, right? Um, feeding it through, you can use their own webcam software. You can feed it through something like the cam link, like what I do. Um, but just getting it piece by piece. And the nice thing is, is you don't need to get it all at once. You can upgrade the microphone and then you can wait a month and then you can upgrade the camera. Then you can wait a month and you can get better lighting. And then piece by piece, you can build something together. And then once you invest in it once, you never have to do it again. So um, it's not a recurring cost by any means. It's just, you know, piece it out to how you want to piece it out and know that you can kind of build on it over time. And then I've seen people who, you know, they message me pictures of their setups and they got three or four cameras now and they got the, the crazy little stream decks. And they got all, all this cool stuff, teleprompters and things like that. But you don't need that to get started. Just start with a really good microphone. Um, the SM7Bs, by the way, why I recommend them, and this is really important is because people um, people always spend around $500 on their microphone, but they don't realize it because they either buy a $100 or $200 microphone and they buy $300 of cheap, crappy looking foam to put all over their office to block out all the reflections or the noise. Or they can like buy nice instead of buy twice and just get a really good microphone like this SM7B, which is uh, designed to only pick up on your voice and nothing else. There could be someone playing Metallica you know, full blast on the other side of your office wall. And if you have this microphone, it will barely pick it up because it is just tuned into, you You know, only picking up what's in front of you. So it really is one of those things where it's like, you know, you can try buying like a blue mic and try buying, you know, one of these other mics that's on the market and then watch yourself having to figure out how to soundproof and sound reduce your entire office or your home or things like that. Um, or you just buy like a, a good microphone from the start that's designed to just only pick up on your voice and benefit from that as well. Yeah, dude, that's huge. Um, and and also i want to drive this home because i know that on on podcasts like these especially when you're talking with you know the like higher level techie you know ceos talking about these things that that seem very you know opinion based as far as like cause especially with a lot of like branding guys you know a lot of people just see it and they're like you know uh yeah like i'm sure that audio is important but like he's just trying to sell me some shit you know, or like, you know, he he only says that because he's really, you know, in tune with branding. But I'm I'm going to challenge that a little bit and ask if you've ever watched like, let's say like the first 48, you know, any of like the uh, the true crime shows. If you look at it, the vast majority of those episodes are just a like a static tripod shot of a street lamp in the rain and all you have are some subtitles to read. Those go on for minutes at a time and you are fully tuned in. But if your audio sucks, it doesn't matter what the hell's going on on screen, you will not watch it, I yeah. promise. So yeah. yeah, that's huge. I'm really glad that you brought that up. And if you ever, if you ever um, wanna test this out, go find a podcast that is not professionally made, go to one of their first episodes and see if you can find an episode where they didn't take the audio and make it in both ears. So it's only on the left and only on the right. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> see how long you can listen to that before you want to harm somebody else. <laughs> and you have that rage inside because you want to listen to this podcast in both ears and it's only in this one and then come back and say if audio quality is important. Yep. Dude, that's 110%. Um, okay. So I really want to get into this too, because this I, I feel is super important, especially because I actually made this mistake early on. And I'm sure a lot of you here did too. Um, so a lot of people misconstrue, you know, they're like, I, I know I need a big audience. You know, I know that I need to create, co uh, you know, constantly create content that is going to build no like and trust so that I can build an audience, mm -hmm. but they don't quite realize the difference between a massive audience in terms of volume versus an audience that may be a little bit smaller, but is the people that you actually want to speak with. So 100%. as, as far as that goes, um, you know, what types of tactics have you used in the past with your clients to make sure that they one understand this, but yeah. two, 
um, you know, are staying away from just trying to, you know, get more followers and are actually building quality relationships. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I'll, um, I'll explain this with a little bit of a story that, that I've shared with my clients that they found is really useful. Um, so, uh, while, while I was working with local businesses, uh, kind of my day job in marketing, I was promoting concerts on the side. And there was this one particular DJ who was uh, a long time ago, probably about like 10 years ago. Um, he, he was a mid-level DJ. He was probably being able to get paid uh, in that world, like 2000 to $3,000 a show, which is like when you're just barely starting to tour, that's like where you're at. And so he was at that level, but he started blowing up on Facebook because he found that even more than making music and playing shows, he had a better talent for creating memes and finding good memes. And so this guy who should have a DJ page of like 5,000 fans or something like that blew up to over 4 million in like 18 months. And so looking at that, you know, if you looked at just by size of audience with DJs at the time, the only DJs who had millions of fans on Facebook were like Skrillex, Avicii, Martin Garrix, uh, Diplo, Calvin Harris, right? Like the, the big guys who are getting paid a million dollars a show and, you know, to go play New Year's Eve somewhere in Vegas or, or things like that. And so um, I was really interested to see, okay, now that this guy has this huge audience, like, is he going to be doing that? Is he going to have his name at the top of the festival flyer at Coachella, like Calvin Harris does, because he has millions of followers? Um, but turns out, no. In fact, even though he had millions and millions of followers, um, he was still at the very bottom. Because whenever he posted what he should have built his audience around, which was music, he might get 20 comments and five likes. But when he posted a meme, he got 40,000 shares because he had built his audience around not the actual main thing that he was doing. So engagement guys is, um, it's a tool. It's a tool. And just like you can use a tool, the tool can also use you. And you can use engagement and use content with an audience of a few thousand people to make all of your dreams come true. But if you try to chase engagement, and because say, I don't know, maybe you you posted a picture of uh, your dog yesterday and it got five times more likes and got more shares than pictures of your business or things like that. And you think, man, I'm gonna do another thing about my dog. Well, it, it's, it's careful, like be careful because you don't wanna build your audience around the wrong thing. Is your audience here to see pictures of your dog or is your audience here to patronize your business? Kind of a thing. So most people underestimate what they can do when they are consistent with content. And they overestimate what they can do when they go viral. That's the other thing as well. You know, um, probably Parker, you hear this a lot being in video. Hey, um, I, I get it, but I want this to do 500,000 views for this reel. I need this to do a million views. I need this to do X amount of views, um, yes. which is actually not, not the case. And if you're a local business, especially, um, you probably don't even have, you know, 500,000 ideal customers in your local area, right? So some businesses out there, you don't even have 500,000 people in your entire town. So why would you want to be able to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of views online for people who can't even come and patronize your business? So instead, building a deeper audience, right? Um, Kevin Kelly wrote a fantastic essay a long time ago called A Thousand True Fans, which is just really, you just, if you want to make a basic living, say $50,000 a year living, which is just, you know, with these days and inflation, it's a lot less than it was when Kevin Kelly wrote about it. But, um, you know, if you want to make a $50,000 a year living, you really just need a thousand people to give you 50 bucks a year, right? Or a hundred people to give you 500 bucks a year, right? Um, you don't need a ton of people in order to grow in order to scale. So all that to say, um, really with my clients, what we focus on is like, Hey, engagement can be a tool. Like we can definitely use engagement to grow audience and to build deeper trust with the people that we want to work with and to, you know, build a relationship with them as well. But um, avoid the trap of building your brand around the wrong things. Um, just because it gets engagement doesn't mean it's what you want to be built on. And while you could build fast, if you focus on posting memes and pictures of your dog and, you know, jokes and, you know, kitschy things like that. Um, you know, I, I think that the DJ that I shared at the beginning, who got to 4 million Facebook fans, uh, I think he probably would have rather grown slow compared to grown fast if I talked to him. And I think he would much rather would have been able to have people there be for his product and for his music than to be there for what he was posting to chase engagement. Dude, hundred percent. And you know, guys, the thing I really like about sky is his just uncanny ability to put a story 
to everything, you know, and, and that really, really does fall in line with being a branding expert, you know, and, and just like we've talked about earlier, you know, with making associations between what people do know and what people don't know, what we've noticed recently, because we've, we've tried to really start incorporating analogies and stories and stuff into our own content. And it's performing 10 times better simply because we're, we're not just blabbing about, you know, what we do. Instead, we're telling you what we do and explaining it in a way that you can understand and makes not only sense, but relatable sense to you. 100%. Um, so I think, I think that's really cool. Um, but also to kind of piggyback off this too, like I do hear that all the time about how I just want, you know, a, a bajillion views on, on this video. And what people don't understand is that there are so many people in your audience right now that are stalking you that yep. we, we like to call them lurkers, yeah. you know, where they don't, they don't comment, they don't like, they don't share or anything, but they're watching you. And mm -hmm. now like after building my audience for the last year or so, we have a huge influx in inbound leads. I don't even have to do outbound sales anymore. Everyone just shows up because we've built a, a platform that attracts the people that we want to work with, you know, mm -hmm. and it's the exact same thing that we're selling within our business to you. So the big thing that I, I want to kind of, you know, really harp on here is that you don't need a billion views to build a community. You know, mm -hmm. you don't, you, you also should not measure your performance of how many views or how many likes you get on one video. It should be how many people are seeing a series of, you know, 50 videos, like how many people have seen all the, the reels that you posted in the last six months that are ready to go now, mm -hmm. you know, because it takes time to, to build no like, and trust. Like there was a study that just came out that said the number of, or like the average number of touches that someone needs to do with a brand in order to feel safe, making a purchasing decision has gone up to like 12 to 16, which is unreal. And that's why like, I'm, I'm always so hesitant for the people that are like, well, I just need one video, you know, or I just need like one killer video ad. Well, here's the thing is you got that idea from an agency like the Harmon brothers who are out here making, you know, ads for like purple mattress and for, you know, squatty potty and all those viral commercials. What you don't see is the millions of dollars that they spent testing a hundred other versions of that exact mm -hmm. same video to find the one that worked. Yeah. So it wasn't one video. Yeah. You know, and, and essentially what we're doing with branding is we're doing all of that testing organically out in front of everyone at a far fewer cost or a false or the far smaller cost than, yeah. um, you know, than it would be to create a, a video ad like that. So I think that's really important as well. And, you know, Sky, what do you, I guess, what do you tell people that are like, you know, I, I know I need to build my brand, but like I need leads tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. Great question. So if you need leads tomorrow, uh, that that's not a brand problem. I mean, that's, that's a business problem. Right. And my question would be like, Hey, where are your existing leads? Where's your existing database? Like, are you actually following up with them? Are you actually doing right by them? Because most people, most businesses, doesn't matter what industry, every single industry I walk into, there is a database that needs reactivated. There are customers that need followed up with. There are calls that are not being answered. There are messages on the, you know, on the answering machine that aren't being called back. So like fix that first. Um, if you do need leads tomorrow though, um, the best thing that you can do is just take a hundred percent control of that. And what do I mean by that is just manual audience build. Um, when, when I was running my agency, I wish we would have done this. We encourage clients to do this, but I wish we would have done it ourselves, which is if you're running a Facebook account send out 50 friend requests every single day so that you can just be building up an audience of people who you can show your content to give them those 12 to 16 touches which by the way, you can time collapse if you just post more, by the way. Uh, make sure it's still good because it has to be good touches, not like I just threw this, you know, I just threw up this this garbage reel of me in my pajamas because I wanted to post five times today, but make it good. And, um, but yeah, but start building that audience and take that into your control. 
you know, follow 50 people a day on Instagram. And at the end of the week, unfollow the people who haven't followed you, do it all over again. And do that in addition to your content so that you have people who are readily available to see your stuff. Um, and so while like, yes, like you can be using video to get followers and, um, th that could be like a, an important metric, especially if something is on brand, right? It's talking about the thing you want to talk about. It's not like the, you know, the music guy doing memes, but it's actually about his music and he gets a bunch of followers. Like that could be like an indicator, like, Hey, maybe we should do a little bit more of that because we're talking about the right things. And we're getting some good results. Um, but I like to stack the deck and when people talk about David and Goliath, um, you know, they like to talk a lot that, you know, David swung this stone and hit Goliath in the forehead. But as, um, as one of my favorite, um, writers on strategy, uh, Friedman talks about is he's like, Hey, like not only did, did David shoot the sword or shoot the stone, but he actually walked over the sword and cut off the head afterwards. So what can you do to guarantee that you're doing that? You're able to grow that audience. What can you do to, that? You're able to guarantee that you're actually getting leads. So just daily follows daily friend requests, the boring things. Um, if you do that, and if you have your profile optimized to some point where there is a little bit of branding on there, so people will see that follow, they'll see some cool content. They'll be able to see, you know, a good bio that describes what you do and, you know, put you actually in a place of maybe being of authority or being of value or being of use to those people. Um, then you can actually see your account grow by a steady 10 to 15 people per day, which, you know, do that for a month. That's an extra 300 followers. There's probably some clients in there. Do that for another month, 600, and then pretty soon. Um, not only will you be able to, uh, continue to rely on that steady growth, but you actually have more of a base, especially if you guys are doing Instagram marketing, if you guys are doing TikTok marketing, um, you have more of a base of people who are following you that can give you those engagement signals that could actually tip over your videos to becoming more viral or getting more reads or getting in front of more eyeballs because you have enough of an initial audience to start giving it that push and give it that momentum. Yeah. And, um, I want to piggyback off that too. So Sky has this lead magnet that I like, I still use to this day. It's called 50 new faces. And it's the exact same framework that he just laid out as far as, um, you know, getting it's, I think it's, is it specific to Facebook groups? Yep. Facebook groups. So okay. 50 new faces formula, uh, invite 40 people to your group every day, go into your invites and click remind on 40 people, give them another notification to join your group, uh, and then clear out. 40 old invites. I, I do this myself, just did it last night before bed. Uh, clear out 40 old invites so that you have the opportunity to reinvite them again, because since the last time you invited them, and now they've probably been in the back of the room, lurking on your content, seeing what you're doing, they got more touches. And maybe when they didn't accept your invite first, they would now accept it again. Yeah, that's huge. Um, so I do also want to before we move on to the next one. Um, I want to kind of break this belief real quick about how, you know, there's a lot of people that that kind of assume that when they create content, especially video, because for whatever reason, people feel very different about how they present themselves on video, or at least most people do. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, they don't want to say anything that could upset anybody, you know, they don't want to make waves. Yeah. And I 100% disagree with this, because I feel like in, in being able to attract the people that you want while polarizing against the people that you do not want to talk to, you know, I feel like that is a much more surefire way to build an audience of people that you actually want to speak with and not have exactly. a bunch of people that are just a, you know, a higher number on your, on your follower account that aren't going to serve you. And sometimes even like talk shit in your comments. Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. And, um, and I guess what, what do you have to say about that as far as, um, you know, someone who thinks that like, you know, I just, I don't want to rock the boat. You know, what, what type of advice would you have for them? Look at who you passionately align with as a brand. So for example, are you a Swifty? Are you, do you like Kanye West? Do you like Supreme? Do you like, um, a sports team, right? Maybe you're a 49ers fan or I think chiefs are going to Super Bowl as well. You're a chiefs fan, right? You know, are, are you, are you? When you look at your deep loyalties to another brand or to a public figure or something like that, you know, who do you actually align with? 
And then when you look at that, ask yourself, like, do these people have haters? How polarizing are these people that I already enjoy, right? Um, it's to the point where um, my daughter, she's in third grade. Uh, if she has told me that if you say the word Taylor Swift to a boy in third grade, he will scream and yell and run away because it is like, there's like, there's no more cooties anymore. There's like Taylor Swift. And when her teacher put on Taylor Swift for a dance party that they had at school, uh, all the boys hid underneath the tables and screamed because it was too girly and it was too Taylor Swifty. Meanwhile, this is like the biggest brand in the world right now. So you, like, think about where your own loyalties lie. You know, are you, are you a, a Swifty? Are you um, a Star Wars fan? Are you a this fan? Are you a that fan? And then look at the people who talk shit on it, right? Look at, look at how polarizing and how crazy people go in, you know? Things are not for everybody. And when you realize that, um, you realize that really great art divides the room. A great brand will divide the room. Be like, hey, that is not my kind of person, right? And when you look at the people who we typically um, dislike the most, right? You even look at movies, like, you know, the, the people who we just like, we see on screen, we're like, oh, that guy are the people who are lukewarm. They don't really have an opinion. They don't really have a side they're on. They'll switch sides depending on what's popular. You know, they're they're sleazy, they're traitorous, they're, you know, these kind of things. We actually don't like those people in general. No. And so if you are one of those people, um, chances are you do have some fear. Fear of, you know, cancel culture, fear of being canceled, fear of being rejected, fear of not being liked, fear of being unprofessional. All of these different things can pop up. Um, but all of those, all of those things are very, very subjective, you know. Um, people might not say it's professional for me to be wearing a ripped up denim jacket and uh, a hat on a, a podcast. You know, I should be in a suit and wearing loafers or something like that. Um, but this is this is my brand. This is what this is who I am. And so um, when you when you don't put yourself out there in a way that actually creates contrast, um, what you actually risk doing is you risk um, you risk leaving the people who are like you um, or people who are like your brand uh, alone. So if, if I were to show up in a suit and a tie, which, you know, I, I have uh, and I, I could and I, I dress up very well, uh, the, the people who I want to work with who are, you know, maybe a little bit rougher around the edges in terms of their appearance, they're, they're great people, but they're tattooed. You know, I, I have clients who have like their necks blasted and, and things like that too. Awesome guys, right? I, I might not necessarily appeal to that. And those are kind of my people. I grew up in skate parks. I grew up in music clubs. I grew up, you know, like that, the subculture is my life in some ways. And so, um, so that to say, um, you, you risk not bringing in your tribe when you actually hide who you are, when you're afraid of being unprofessional, afraid of being on this, on that. And you can fix a lot of that by A, just being bold and like actually speak your truth. And when you speak your truth and you speak your power and you know that you're the real deal, um, you would be amazed at what happens amazed what happens of how many people who were in the back of the room will actually respond to you. And then on the second thing is that there is a way that you can polish what you are doing. Even if you feel like, hey, you know, I, I just feel like I should show up like Mark Zuckerberg in a hoodie and jeans and all this, you can still do that in a way that makes you look polished, makes you look professional, makes you look of quality, someone who is knowable, likable, trustable, all those different things, um, and be able to rock from there. Dude, I, so I have a great story for that. Um, so literally yesterday, um, I had, so I had a meeting with a, uh, with a prospect and I brought in one of my, um, awesome colleagues who runs a lot of workshops with me. Um, but her brand is very similar to mine and skies where we are very just unapologetically ourselves, yep. you know, and we we had to show up to um to this business with they were you know a, a bit older and um just the more like traditional conservative type and she had texted me beforehand she goes you know i don't i don't really know what to wear cuz like i don't want to um you know i like i want to make a deal with these people and i don't want to make them uncomfortable um and i was like, dude, that, you know, it doesn't really matter. And she's like, all right, I'm, I'm going to wear this shirt that says, uh, not today, Satan with a blazer. And <laughs> she freaking killed it. And now lo and behold, those people love that. Not because it was in line with their values and beliefs, but because she was unapologetically herself, you know, yeah. and, and now 
she's got a proposal sent out today. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, and you know, I've, I've experienced that too. And there's so many people, even in this group right now that I have, um, that I've just thought that, you know, there's no way that I would get along with these people. You know, there's no way that they're going to resonate with my content. I met with, um, one of now, one of my favorite people in this group, um, months and months ago. And, uh, she's a realtor. I'm not gonna, uh, say who she is, but she is, um, I think, uh, like late forties, fifties ish, and just a very like traditional conservative type of realtor, or at least I thought, and we met up for the first time and she like, this caught me off guard. So, so bad. Um, but she goes, yeah, you know, I, I just, I heard you say fuck one time on, on a reel the other day. And like, I knew you were my guy and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> whoa. Okay. Sure. Cool. Yeah. And, and now it's one of the best relationships that we have. And we haven't even like worked together on the agency side. Yeah. You know, and it's just an incredible relationship. And, you know, I think that's one thing that a lot of us really don't take into account when it comes to brand building is that you're not trying to just sell everyone. You're there to make a genuine connection with these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the, the biggest fear that people have when they start working with someone um, outside of like, you know, logistics, like money and time and things like that is, is this person who they say they are, right? And so if, if you're, you know, putting yourself out there in content and you want to say fuck, but you do not say fuck and you are coming off um, incongruent in that way, people read off, like they read into that. They know when the marketing guy across from them is just giving them numbers instead of telling them how their business is growing, right? And so, and so that to be said, um, you know, if, if you can give people a taste of who you actually are inside of your content, and then they get to meet you, and they get to be like, "Yeah, Parker, you're my guy," because you said "fuck," right? Um, that's great. People are also always wanting permission to be themselves. They always want to have permission to be themselves. Every single one of us, we have rooms inside of ourselves we have locked off to the public, or we have only open to certain people in our lives. Um, and so that to be said, um, everyone just has a desire to be like more of themselves and more accepted for that. And so if you were able to be yourself and create a community, like you have Parker, where, you know, you are unapologetically yourself, uh, I see some of your posts and I'm like, man, that's so Parker, you know? And, uh, <laughs> so like, I'll see those posts. Um, but, but you being able to unabashedly be yourself also gives permissions for your clients, for your peers, for the other people in that community, uh, to be themselves as well. So it's a ripple effect and it can all start with just you saying fuck on a reel or just being, you know, congruent to who you actually are um, and be able to go from there. Absolutely. That, yeah, that's so huge. Um, okay. So let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about some um, big, like costly mistakes that people make when they kind of start branding by themselves, but they mm. don't really know what they're doing. You know, what, are, what are you seeing that? like are common mistakes that are made that typically are very difficult to fix. Yeah, for sure. So the, the thing that people make the most when they start branding, uh, there, there's two mistakes. Number one, they brand to the industry, not to the customer. So, you know, if, if Parker, you were like, Hey, you know, most video agencies, they have a, um, they have a camera right inside of there. I think you have an aperture lens on your logo. Um, but you know, most, most of them have a video camera, like a, you know, a reel to reel camera. So I was like, all right, we're going to put, you know, like a, a cinema camera on our logo because that's what everyone else is doing. Right. I see this all the time when we worked in the, the med spa space all the time, it was like, you know, uh, a lady holding a syringe or something or a pair of lips or, or things like that, you know, cause it was <laughs> Botox and lip filler and things like that. Um, but that's not actually what the, um, but, but as we kind of started this off talking about customer stories, um, the customer has a different story, right? And so how can we actually brand to the customer? What do they actually want? Because there's a way, and actually, funny enough, um, one of the med spots that we worked the closest that, I mean, we took them from, through the pandemic, we took them from doing like 1.5 up to 6 million. Um, what we actually did with them is their logo was nothing like any other thing. They won best of city two years in a row. They got PR and featured all over the place. And the brand had nothing, nothing, nothing to do with aesthetics, but it had everything to do with high end, had everything to do with how to create a, like a, a kind of a luxury brand and tie that into stories that they have. So that's the first thing is like looking around and being like, Hey, that person over there, this is in the coaching industry. Oh my gosh. All the time. That person has this font and it's black and gold. So I'm just going to copy 
their entire, you know, their entire um, brand. I'm going to change two words in the title and I'm going to just, you know, brand hack. Like that's, that's the worst thing you guys could do. Um, the, the second mistake that you guys are going to make is you're going to spend 80% of your time focused on deliverables and 20% focused on foundation instead of 80% on foundation, 20% on deliverables. What do I mean by that? So when, when people think, Hey, I need a logo for my business. They don't really think what logo do I need? They think who can actually make it for me. Right. And there's, there's a million people who can make it for you. Right. Like I make logos for clients. You can go to Fiverr, 99 designs, whatever. There, there's all these places you can get a logo, but how do you know that it's actually going to be the right logo? How do you know it's actually going to be communicating the values that you have? It's going to be communicating the story that you have. It's going to be there for your mission. It's going to be there for your purpose. It's going to be there to serve your voice. Right. So like with us, when we work with clients, we actually spend, you know, more time in figuring out who they are. Um, and, and luckily after years and years of doing this, I, we can now, now condense that usually into like a two hour interview. Um, but we actually figure out like, Hey, who are you before we build this brand? Because what happens is yeah, what people do is they'll get a new website, new set of business cards, new logos that look really good. They're like, those don't really feel like me. Doesn't, something feels off here. I don't know. And then in a couple more years, you know, they're like, all right, I need to get a new set of business cards, a new website, a new logo. So it doesn't quite fit because they never actually spent the time working with someone who was more focused on figuring them out and what needs, what's the story that needs to be told here. And then how can we tell that through things like logos and fonts and colors and business cards and websites and things like that versus just thinking, I need a logo, I need a website, I need a business card, and then having to redo it every two to five years. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I actually like before, you know, learning about you, I was not very conscious of my brand. You know, I had mm -hmm. I had a friend who was a graphic designer that luckily came up with a at least I feel is a pretty kick ass logo for what it is, for sure. um, you know, and that that was my extent of branding. Hell, for the longest time, I didn't even use the same font. Yeah. Like for, for everything. Yeah. And, and I saw you talk about that in a post. I was like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> it's consistency. I even, like, I didn't even know what font we used. You yeah. know, I didn't know like the hex code on, on the colors and, you know, all those things that you don't think would make a difference, but make a huge difference. Mm. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm glad that you brought, um, I'm glad that you brought up the fact that it's not just a fucking logo. You know, it's, it's the story behind your brand and what you're trying to portray to the world, you 100%. know, and I, I think that's, that's brilliant. And now you're making me think about changing my logo. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the biggest thing too, is like work, work with somebody. Even I have people who advise me on my brand, um, and, um, work with someone who can hold that mirror up in front of you because we've, I've never seen a client who walked in to one of those brand interviews who knew themselves a hundred percent and what their brand was. And we always somewhere inside of that two hours, we find where, Hey, you said it was this way, but now that we're actually talking, it is this way. And then it's usually those things. So that's the other thing that kind of holds people back from creating content or, you know, putting their brand out there that they have these mismatches and they don't quite know where they are. They don't quite know why they're there. They can maybe function and put out content, you know, regardless. Um, but you know, we have clients who, you know, we've worked with them. We kind of cleared out these, these mismatched values and mismatched stories. And they go from, you know, working for someone else to, you know, fully working on their own to speaking for people like Tony Robbins. I mean, doing like crazy things all because their message just gets into that alignment and they kind of remove the imitation. They remove the imposter syndrome. They remove everything like that. Yeah. hundred percent, dude. Um, so we are, coming close on time here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a couple because we've honestly, we've talked a lot about the, um, the authenticity side of things as well. So I do. So I get this question a lot, like, where do I need to post? You know, mm -hmm. where, where should my content be going as far as my business page versus my personal page? And what, what's the difference between what I should be posting on each platform. Mm. So, and I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about this because I have a lot of people that are really apprehensive about posting on their personal page and like building a personal brand because they're like, well, I mean, I own a business, so I should build the business brand. So mm. what, I guess, what do you have to say about that? 
Yeah. So the first question is like, what is your role in the business? You know, if you are an owner operator, but you're not really working with customers on a daily basis, you're kind of in the background and you have employees, it probably makes more sense to build the business brand. Right. But if you're a service provider, you know, you are, even if you have staff, but like you're the, you know, you're the master esthetician and you have all these other estheticians underneath you. Um, what actually behooves you more is to build your personal brand, because if you are in a service-based business, people love celebrity. They love working with competence. They love working with who they perceive to be the best of the best. And so if you run something like, you know, potentially a, an arcade or a bowling alley or um, something where you're kind of in the background, right? And people aren't going to necessarily know you, but they're going to know the experience they have when they frequent your establishment, then building the business brand is probably where I would focus. But if you have your hands on the customers, right? You know, if you are a service provider, if you are, you know, um, in the business, working with customers day in, day out, seeing people, seeing patients, cutting hair, whatever it might be, um, your personal brand is going to be the best move for you. Because number one, that's probably the reason why people go to you. Um, people, when they choose service providers, they choose based off of the fit of that provider nine times out of 10. And then they make up that, that provider is good. Like, oh, yeah, you know, Sally does a great job cutting my hair. Sally could be a shit hairdresser. But because you and Sally can gab along, you know, and you enjoy it, then you think that Sally is a good hairdresser when really you just have a personal relationship. So if you're in that kind of relationship business um, or, you know, if you do business development and that's something that you do really well, like going to the chamber, um, you know, networking, you know, getting lunch and learns and um, meeting people and things like that. Um, when you're really good at you know handing your business card over, then your personal brand is just going to amplify that. So it's just kind of that question, you know, are you a like front of the house entrepreneur or are you a back of the house entrepreneur? And if you're at the front of the house, then I would invest 80% into your personal brand, 20% into your business brand. What I still would do is like if you're on Instagram, do collaborations between your accounts so that you can cross post those between both accounts. So you have your personal brand and your business brand um, and still mention your business brand uh, and keep that front and center because um, the Holy grail, uh, at least I believe the Holy grail for local business is branded search. So we actually would measure the success of how our marketing was doing partially based off of revenue, but partially based off of how many people are typing in the name of the business on Google every single month. Because if you have people who are typing up prime edge media, Parker, then you know, you are making a splash outside of your content because they are thinking of you when you are not in front of them and they're finding you to see how they can do business with you. So if you were to build your personal brand and also not mention the name of the business, um, that's where you can potentially kind of run into run into some problems there. Yeah, dude, I am so glad I asked you that question because I, I legit thought that I knew what you were going to say and it wasn't that at all. So because I've never thought about it that way as far as the um, like what your role is in the business. Yeah. You know, I've always been kind of the, the guy that's like, if you're the face of the business, you need to have a personal brand. Yeah. You know, but, but that's as far as I've kind of dove into it. So I'm glad, I'm glad that you brought that up. All right. Our last, our last question I have for you here is, so let's just say I'm, I'm a small business owner, you know, I'm making 80 to hundred K a year. And I really don't understand like why the hell anybody would do branding. I think it's a waste of time. You know, and in everyone that I've heard just says that I need to do cold outreach and paid ads and that's it. You know, what do you have to say to me in order to convince me that that is absolutely not the case? Look at the people who are crushing it in your industry and come back whether or not they have a brand. <laughs> Look at the people who are the best of the best and then see how they present themselves. Are your websites on a similar par? Do you have things as consistent as they do? Are you as potentially as omnipresent as they are, right? Do you have things in place that they have in place? And now it can be, um, there can be a kind of a chasing your tail with branding. And so you have to also know that, Hey, you know, your numbers, you know, your margin, you know, your sales, you know, your acquisition process. Cause there's a lot of people out there who have, you know, contractors who have big lifted wrap trucks with no money in the bank. It's like, that's a thing too. But, but what you need to be looking at is like the game that you want to play likely if you want to grow this business will require you to level up things from time to time. And if you don't believe you need to level up your brand, just take a look at the people who are crushing it, right? You might be at the top of your local market. So, Hey, 
Why don't you look at the national market? Why don't you look at the regional market? Who else in the state? Who else in the country, right? Look at what they're doing. And then come back to see, hey, does this brand actually hold up next to it? And if it doesn't, that's when you probably need to invest, right? Absolutely. Man, dude. And that's another huge thing too is like, I think a lot of people don't want to do the boring stuff. So they just focus on the new shiny thing, which is yeah. like, you know, the, the 15th color iteration on your new logo that you don't need. And, yeah. you know, uh, like how, how your, you know, your trifold like brochures look that no one's looking at because you're an online business, you know, and like yeah. things like that. I feel like people really can get lost in that and do. Um, what is, I guess, what's one one big thing that you tell those people that, especially if you notice that like with your own clients, you know, what's the best way to kind of get out of that? Yeah, for sure. So you just have to focus on fundamentals first. Um, fundamentals first is the core value inside of our agency um, is, hey, do the boring stuff first and everything else comes later. So fundamentals, that could be waking up today and calling your leads back. It could be sending out 50 friend requests on Facebook, inviting 40 people to your group. Those are the bedrock, knowing your costs coming in, going out, knowing your, when you acquire a new customer, how much are you paying for that? When you are servicing them, how long do they stay? And how much money do you make off of that over time? Um, when you know these things, then you can use the brand and things to amplify. Um, but brand, if you're not, if you're using brand to distract yourself from the foundations, don't actually, it's not a problem with branding. It's actually a problem with procrastination. It's a problem with fear, whether that be a fear of actually being successful, fear of looking at the numbers and realizing how horseshit they are, right? Fear, fear of whatever it might be. So you, you'll, you'll, you know, fear of being rejected by a client because you're going to call them up and, you know, the, the lead's going to, you know, talk back in your face or something like that. Um, but um, really, if you do find yourself in that place, then just recognize what that fear is and then just lean into it. Have some courage, be able to do the thing anyway, um, and be able to, um, be able to really combat that procrastination, that sabotage and do what actually needs to be done. Absolutely. That's, that's such a great point. Um, let's see here. So last thing, um, what is so well, and let's say that you just convinced me, what is one huge move that I can make today that will be like my, you know, the, the 20% thing that's going to move 80%. Yeah, for sure. Um, Find someone who can work with you on your brand, whether that be a brand boot camp or hiring a brand specialist. Um, before you actually go into hiring a designer or a website maker or anything like that, like get that thing right. Um, and then once you're able to get that thing right, then start, you know, hiring, even if you have to wait a while, you know, you you'd spend your your first initial chunk actually on that specialist. Um, totally okay because you're gonna have the clarity, you're gonna have the insight, you're gonna have the vision. You're going to be able to actually know what it should say, what it should represent, all of that. Um, and then you'll be able to go for there. Um, the best thing is when the like the designer, um, like that is the same person, right? Where they do get to understand your brand, discover who you are before just, you know, whipping up some logos or whipping up some websites or things like that, uh, some video content. But um, that all to be said, um, it, it does pay to get the insights because you can either do it right or you can do it again. And so just kind of pick your choice, you know, do you want to do it right? Or do you want to have to do this again? I love that, dude. All right. So I know you got to go. Um, where can people find you? Yeah, great question. So uh, search me online, Skystack. You can find me pretty easily there. Um, I am on Facebook. You can search up Skystack. I'm there as well. I do have a group called Marketing for Leaders. It's for personal brands, thought leaders, experts. If you are more of that type of a person, uh, you will love this group. You can come hang out in there with me. Uh, where we do live videos and things just like Parker does all the time. Um, so anyway, man, this has been really, really good. Thanks for asking really good questions, by the way. Like I get <laughs> like, I, I've been on your side. I used to be a journalist. I, I've been on your side a lot. And so when you get asked really quality questions uh, in an interview like this, you can have good rapport going back and forth. It's just awesome, man. So really appreciate you and also being patient with the, uh, with the technical details and, uh, you know, kind of letting me fumble through there, of course, as we're on with the video guy, right? <laughs> 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 of course well you guys have an awesome rest of your friday go kick ass this weekend and uh we will see you guys on monday see ya for sure take care brother